Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. This is Manos Brilakis discussing with leaders in the field of CTO and Complex PCI. Sensei means teacher or master in Japanese. The goal of the Sensei Podcast is to help you learn and improve in CTO and Complex PCI so that you can become the best that you can be and offer your patients the best possible results. Hello and uh, welcome to Sensei Podcast. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Arasi Moran, who is uh, an associate professor at the Medical University of South Carolina and one of the most amazing uh, city operators in North America and around the world. Arasi, welcome and thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you so much, uh, Manos. It's a pleasure. It's an honor. I'm truly honored to be here. No, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, we work together on multiple, on multiple venues and uh, events, but um, the goal of this is to see uh, people, how was your journey in becoming what you are today, an excellent operator for CTO and Complex, and hopefully inspire them and give them some tips and tricks on how to follow the same pathway or follow their own route towards success. So maybe we'll start from the beginning. Um, you know, how did you decide to to go into complex interventions or interventions in general, how did your journey start? Um, I think, you know, we all, most of us go into interventional cardiology because we like the instant gratification, right? There's an occlusion, you open it and the flow is beautiful. And, uh, and the harder it became, the more high there was with the complex interventions. Thankfully, I trained at the medical university where we were very comfortable doing atherectomies, unprotected left main all the time. When I joined here as faculty, we had a peripheral person, we had a structural person, we had a hokum person, like, you know, but the hole which was not filled was uh, chronic total occlusions. So it, uh, uh, one of the device companies came to me and said, why don't you do uh, CTOs? And I was like, oh, that's, there's no way. I'll never, you know, be good enough to do it. And they were like, no, just give it a shot. And uh, things like that. Uh, so I said, okay, fine, let me try it. Um, what's the harm in going for one course? You know, so I went for one course, I actually had a couple of patients who with uh, CTOs who I was managing medically, I took the series with, uh, with me. Uh, it was in Chicago, Tony Martini was running the course. And we finished the course. And I asked him all these questions and all that I kind of what do I say, I got sucked into it I loved it I enjoyed the thrill of it and um, and it, it was almost like it was challenging me how you know it was it was a very personal challenge whether I can get good at it and uh, then after that uh, course I still you know I hadn't done any formal training or anything I was like three years into practice um, the CR uh, CRT um, uh, academy, the CTO Academy at CRF was going on. And it, I saw all of you guys up on stage. And uh, it was uh, you, Dimitri, uh, Bill Lombardi, all of you guys were on stage. And after that CTO Academy day, there was a cocktail reception. So I decided I have to introduce myself to one of you all and try to <laughs> figure out what the next step should be. So I walked up to the bar, got myself a full glass of white wine, took just gulped the whole thing, got some liquid courage in me. And I watched uh, the person who I first came across my path was Bill Lombardi. And I just went to Bill and said, hey, Bill. Um, I'm R.C. Marin from Charleston, MUSC. Will you be able to help me uh, learn CTOs? And Bill Lombardi took out his visiting card with his personal cell phone number and said, here it is and go for it and call me. And, and after that, he talked to me and he left. And truly it was, I was like gazed and I was like, what, what just happened now? What just happened now? This, this really happened to me uh, and, uh, you know. And then I followed through with it and I got temporary privileges in uh, Seattle, uh, University of Washington. And I went there and spent like a week with Bill. Uh, and then I said, Bill, you have to, this is not enough. Uh, you have to come back to Charleston and teach me how to do CTOs. So I lined up 
Um, and, you know, that was the naivety of me. I, I lined up three cases for Bill and all those three cases were JCTO score four, five. Bill was like, where do you find these patients? <laughs> but this was my path. So either way, uh, Bill came and he proctored me. And then, uh, you know, I, I got... I got comfortable with knuckling wires and things like that. I also, you know, before, after that, I knew I was interested in it. I formed a database of my CTO patients, referrals, everything. So I had like a 10, 12 patient database who I would bring them once a week, tell them, you know, full disclosure, I'm learning it. And I'll pro- I pr- all I can promise you, I'll be safe. You know, I, I'll try my best and I will be safe. And patients appreciated that honesty and trusted me and uh, came to me. And uh, so and slowly, almost every month I got a proctor and I did uh, uh, several proctored cases before I became comfortable with it and then started doing cases alone. Perfect. So essentially, uh, you know, just get inspired, uh, got the courage to go in and dive into right into the action, it looks like. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think it's it's a field sport. You have to be in the field and play the game. <laughs> and then when you started getting good at it, when did you start feeling good? Like how many cases did it take for you to feel confident that you don't need to get proctors or you can do more complex cases on your own? Funnily enough, I got very comfortable with retrograde PCI, very comfortable, like, you know, septal collaterals. I think my fourth or fifth septal collaterals, I was like, okay, I can do this. It's okay. ADR was definitely more challenging for me because at that time we just had the stingray wire until I ivest and saw my wires in the true lumen. I I would be like spasmed everywhere. Oh my God. <laughs> and then the final angiogram where there's a good flow. I think retrograde CTO PCI was more, you know, once you get the wire, I, I felt very comfortable. Uh, I'm going to have a great result, etc. The steps didn't uh, overwhelm me. Uh, so I think... Um, that was uh, anti-grade CTOs, anti-grade dissection re-entry. I needed about 25 to 40 cases almost uh, to be like, okay, I can do a ADR and be comfortable and not be like, oh, what's going to happen kind of a, a sensation, you know? Yeah, and actually that's counterintuitive, right? Because many people are more concerned about the retrograde approach and undergrade. And as you are, I think you are right that many of the advanced undergrade ADR re-entry can be very, very challenging. Yes. Now, in terms of, I, I of time, I find any of challenging. <laughs> Wonderful. So, how? So, uh, you started doing these cases, and you start doing more and more. Um, how do you keep on learning? Now, people are not coming anymore because you're, you know, fairly, fairly good and self-sufficient. But do you still learn? Do you feel that you are things to learn? You feel pretty comfortable now with most of your cases. There's always new stuff to learn. I mean, there's no full stop to this learning curve at all. I uh, There are so many things I learned. I, I can't... Uh, okay, let me try and uh, think about... Like, when I first came in, just knuckling was uncomfortable, right? So knuckling was uncomfortable. Then you the first two years... Obviously, my case case selection was uh, very, uh, I was being very selective. So I'd come to CTO Summit and I'll see the complications and I'll be like, how come I'm not having these complications? What is going on? And then I realized I was not pushing the envelope. So when I started pushing the envelope, complications were happening. And then I was like, oh, so CTO PCI is not about... CTO <laughs> itself, it's about making sure you manage the complications which comes along the way, and then you can send the patient home safely. So the learning curve is, um, you know, it's infinity. It's an infinite mode, and uh, there is no end to the learning. I, I learn by watching life cases. And when I want to see life cases, I want to see the operator struggle. So I don't want the operator going and wiring it in two seconds. That annoys me. I want to see them struggle and see them work through the problem and the algorithm in their um, end. And that I, I think that has a lot of uh, learning potential for me. Uh, so, yeah, life cases, all the conferences. I mean, uh, the first beginning stage when I was like, considered the early person, I was watching videos after videos after videos. I mean, you watch, you learn so much by watching. 
No, absolutely. And then, as you said, um, the complications come with the more complex cases, and that's always a fine balance, right? So what would you say for people? Um, when do you want to embark into the more complex cases? Um, what, what is the right time for this? Should he have done several of cases, feel very comfortable? Should they train on CTO complications? Like, what is the transition from the easier cases to the more complex, and what is a good time for that? Honestly, I don't know. Sometimes you may not have a choice. You might think, you know, this is a, a very easy case and then you get surprised uh, that this is so hard. And then you, so you better, I don't think you can set yourself, oh, I'm only going to do simple CTOs or only going to do it. You have to train yourself widespread. But obviously your first case cannot be the only epicardial collateral. That you might have a possibility of choosing, uh, but all cases are going to be complex. My patients initially uh, were all veteran patients and anyone who's uh, worked in the VA will know the calcium burden of a veteran patient and trying to learn ADR in a calcific vessel. I didn't have a choice. Okay. So, so sometimes you don't get the choice. Uh, but if you've done 25 to 30 CTOs, okay, uh, uh, ADR, wire escalation slash ADR cases, that might be a good time to do septal uh, cases. And um, if 10 to 15 septals, maybe then try an epicardial. Your first epicardial, I would always recommend doing it with a proctor so that, uh, you know, in case you need, you don't have experience coiling things and uh, stuff like that, you have another set of brains helping you out with that. So uh, it's uh, it's a very, you know, some people might need only five ADR, but I needed 20 ADRs to get comfortable. So you have to um, personally judge that for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And about complications, as you say, in the beginning, you're careful you don't get them or you're lucky you don't get them, but eventually you will. Um, so how do you learn to manage them apart from learning on the, in the job? Oh, you really don't want to learn on the job. That's the worst way to learn complications. <laughs> Please don't learn complications on the job. Uh, the uh, the courses helped me. Like, you know, in all uh, almost all the CTO courses I've been to, the last session is always on complication. I think we should flip that and make that the first session. Like, you know, about coils, about fat embolizations and things like that. And also phoning a friend. I remember I had a distal LAD perforation. It's a wire perforation, but slow and steadily, uh, you know, patient was still building up fluid. And I had to phone a friend and they said, and uh, Bill Lombardi was like, just inject some fat. You know how to do it. Go do it. And you just need that external push. And I was like, okay, fine. I know how to harvest fat. I will do it. And it was done. So building your network, all these conferences, complications course itself, where, where you have these models, where you have these fat globules, when you can, you know, push the uh, uh, fat into the microcatheter, watch it uh, float. I think uh, you want to learn it outside uh, the patient uh, system. Vein grafts, I started when I fixed the native coronary artery, I would just go ahead and uh, practice coiling the vein graft or using an Amplatz occluder. So I found... Uh, reasonable um, ways, uh, elective ways of learning some of my uh, uh, techniques, which I would use emergently, but it was almost, it's watching uh, watching other people and watching and learning from them. The wheel has been invented. You don't need to be the person inventing the wheel for the first time in, with a life patient who's crashing. Yeah, excellent point. And actually in our lab, we do bring one of the coil reps once a year and we have every fellow deploy three or four coils and make sure everyone is comfortable because as you said if you've never done it the perforation time is probably not the best time to learn how to coil yes absolutely so do you get stressed out i mean you always seem so upbeat and energetic <laughs> oh god how can you not get stressed out um there is a crash after the high, <laughs> which eventually <laughs> comes up, you know, and it, there's a crash after the high when everything is going well. And there is a down which stays down when things go, does not go your way. You know, it is, it is uh, pretty, uh, and you have to be mindful of it. So 
Uh, yes, I do get stressed out. Uh, I do, uh, you know, thankfully, my poison has been chocolates, uh, then alcohol, <laughs> which is very, very socially acceptable. But that didn't do very well for my waistline. So I had to come up with another way of uh, uh, blowing out steam. Uh, um, Peloton has been my uh, stress buster these days um, that I don't do one hour or 90 minutes, just 30 minutes on it just gives me enough endorphins. It, and then weightlifting, I think that's another way. And, uh, you know, sometimes you have a CTO case, it goes badly, but you have another CTO case waiting for you or another left main or something, you still have to keep going. Those times I find a call room or a toilet i don't care i lock myself for five minutes or ten minutes i put on the calm app and i sit down and you know meditate for five minutes or ten minutes and that has massively reset my brain and brought my um uh, kind of like you know puts me back to where i was uh, so that i can go to the next procedure uh, you know fresh as 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 much as i can be so so were you doing that before you took on the CTO Complex PCI or that came after you started the Complex no, CTO? it was PCI? all after my CTO work. <laughs> <laughs> before that, you know, life was like, life was life. <laughs> it was no big deal. <laughs> but it, it could also, I, I mean, you maybe you can tell me, but it was, once you I started doing CTO PCI, the complexity of my non-CTO work started increasing. Like, you know, I was getting almost every calcific disease, almost uh, lots of surgical uh, turndowns from outside of my university. So, uh, so, and obviously in the beginning stages, it was very difficult for me to say, no, 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 I'm not doing it. So I was definitely taking on more than I should be. And then you reach this pressure cooker point. And for me, that pressure pressure cooker point didn't affect work, but instead it affected my family life. I was snapping at home. I was shouting at my kids and, you know, weekends, I would just not be available and present during the weekends. And uh, my husband came and told me that how I'm reserving the best of RSC for work and bringing the worst of RSC to home. And that statement truly hit me. And I was like, okay, fine. I have to change. I have to get better. So I honestly took that as a challenge, like in the sense how I learned to get better at CTOs. I took steps uh, to change my mindset at home with, uh, you know, I got coaching, I started exercising and it was similar to that similar process. I have to get better. The same mindset I had for CTO PCI is the same mindset I had for balancing my uh, brain after CTO PCI. So this is when you started the exercise and the, and yes. the meditation and that made a difference. Yeah, big time, big time. It, it was uh, it was a night and day difference, honestly. <laughs> so I know many people are going to do the same, but you know many people fall off the wagon. Right? They do it for a little while, but then somehow things fall off. So you've been able to do it now consistently. So how uh, how did that I, happen? I mean, that's life, though, right? Uh, I'm uh, I fall off the wagon multiple times too. When you know, when busy work, vacation, travel. But as long as you get back on the wagon, as long as I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because the way I think of it is I made one wrong turn. I'm not going to keep going further, taking more wrong turns and going further away from my destination. I'm just going to recorrect, course correct myself and get back on track. And then how easy was it? I have learned to accept it. Earlier, I used to beat myself. I'm like, oh my God, RSC, how can you not even, you know, exercise for 30 days in a row? Like, then I was like, this is life. It's not all good. It's not all bad. It's good and bad and it's okay. And it's fine, you know, as long as I'm not losing it um, at work or at home, I have given myself grace to, it's okay if I skip workout for three days or things like that. <laughs> Perfect. And I guess like CTO, right? You try plan A. If it doesn't work, you have to go plan B. And yes. you know, what happened, happened. So absolutely, yeah. absolutely agree with you on that. Now, when it comes to the learning part for the people you are teaching now, you have people coming and learning from you and obviously the meetings. Um, how do you, how do you, do you try to help people out to select who you're going to help? How do you uh, teach the people? Can you tell who is going to be a good operator or you teach everyone and see what happens? Uh, that's very interesting. I 
I feel like the people who have taken the steps to come and uh, show interest to come and learn from you, they self-select themselves. And even if they come and learn from you, uh, I feel out of 10 people, maybe four might go out and be successful CTO operators. Uh, the other f- a few might just learn the complex techniques, like just the trapping and, you know, using trap liner, micro catheter techniques. And uh, then some people will just use wire escalation. I, I, I don't aim for all 10 need to be CTO operators. I feel if I have benefited or changed their practice to make it a little bit more safer for the patient, I have won. I mean, that's good enough for me. So my goal is not to make... Um, all 10 of them CTO operators. And then what techniques should work best for them, you think? Is it lecturing them? Is it showing them what happens? Uh, is it uh, having them do it and give them feedback? What is the technique that works best for them to learn? I uh, I think they have to watch. Uh, that definitely is, uh, after watching, if you can go to their lab and watch them work, like how, I, I went to Bill's lab, yes, but when Bill came and when I was doing the techniques and when I had to use the force to knuckle a wire, that's what helped me the most. So I think watching and then them watching you and you watching them uh, are the two best ways, in my opinion. Wonderful. And I know you've been heavily involved, you know, uh, Women as One, in Sky, ACC, so many, many societies. Uh, How helpful has that been for people, you think, to learn through all these avenues that you've been part of? I I think it has been a great uh, uh, movement overall, like especially Women as One. We have had uh, women from all across the world. You're sitting here in Charleston, but talking to people in Australia, in Mexico, and China, in the in Bangladesh. Bangladesh, when they first start the course, they are showing, you know, they show cases and it's all just wire escalation. And by the over the course of the three months, they have they are showing us retrograde cases. They're showing us ADR. So I think, uh, you know, uh, just showing them it can be done and having a close knit group uh, where we are telling them problem solving with them and planning the cases with them. I think it's been a very big uh, um, push and it's been a very it's a lot of positive feedback on that. So I enjoy doing it and I find them very helpful for them, too. Yeah, and actually, for people unfamiliar, Women as One is an organization that helps teach women in all kinds of cardiology. I think not expanding to other parts of medicine to learn te- complex techniques, leadership skills. Essentially, help get more women because, as you know, the women are still underrepresented in our field of interventional cardiology. So, and you've been one of the pioneers of that. Oh, so. And how has that been for you, being a pioneer? Um, you know, bring more women in the area. It's I love it. I you know I've kind of uh, it, it felt like. Uh, I didn't realize I was doing it. And then I was like, oh, this is what I'm doing, kind of. I was a very, very reluctant women in cardiology person because I was like, why am I being identified as a woman? My Me being woman does not matter. I just want to be recognized as a cardiologist and I'm an awesome cardiologist. I don't need this tag of women cardiology and stuff like that. So I was very reluctant. And one of my mentors here said, Arasi, like how many, how many, has anyone given you a leg up? You've never got any leg ups. You've, and here is one little group where you can actually go and talk to them and be a part of it. Why are you refusing it? Just go. And I, you know, I walked in huffing and puffing and stomping and, you know, and all the time rolling my eyes and everything. And, but it, for me personally, that was literally my first break. I showed a, one of the Sky Women in Innovation meetings, I showed a LAD CTO and Aaron Grantham uh, was on the was in the crowd watching it. And then Roxana Mehran goes, oh, Grantham, are you going to in- involve uh, RSC into your boys club? And Grantham turns all red and said, it's not a boys club. <laughs> Anybody's invited. <laughs> Anybody's invited. It's not a boys club. And then that led to an introduction to Grantham, which led to, to come to Charleston and proctor a case for me. So, you know, you never know what opportunity is going to lead where. So take all the opportunities and don't be what I was huffing and puffing to <laughs> go and take this. So and I once I went in there and then there were more women coming to me and talking about complications, you know. 
obviously my husband's a surgeon he has a complication he struggles but he is doing it much more uh, quietly than i am so when i have a complication it's a long run process there's a flair to me dealing with complications <laughs> okay uh, so you know we're talking about that and in most recently in the sky fellows course a lot of women came and told me how oh, you are so right it takes longer for me to deal with it i felt so lonely because i'm taking it longer and it became a support system by itself that it's okay this is who we are we are going to take our own time and that does not make us any less than or any more than anybody else this is who we are so it's uh, it was good it's been uh, nice to have a community uh, where we can talk to each other and educate each other about us no absolutely and as you said this is a team effort right in many things that we do and uh, having the support network from men and women, for that matter, can really help everyone get get better. And actually, I think there were many more women this last year. I think the proportion of women becoming interventionalists has really grown up. So congratulations. I think whatever you've been doing has uh, really been working out very well. Well, it's just not us. I think the men have played an important role in giving us uh, time and space and priority and, and, and funds to, you know, do these programs. So it's been a team effort. It's been the whole community of cardiology and especially the CTO community has been such a welcoming community. And um, I have heard other communities or other subspecialties are not as open and welcoming. Uh, but, you know, the CTO community space has been been such a safe, peaceful, no cantankerous egos attacking you kind of a space. So it's been wonderful. <laughs> and and Arashi, I know you that you have uh, been you know, doing very well in, his, in your institution. So what do you think is the role of the institution, that your colleagues supporting? Because the reality is everyone who does complex cases, sooner or later is going to get complications, things will go well. So how important is that and how has been your experience in that area? It's extremely important. If you don't have buy-in from the institution, your program is doomed for failure. So you need to have buy-in because, first of all, the, at the outset, when you're asking for all these equipment, microcatheters, extra wires, trap liners, trappers, coils, covered stents, you know, the entire gamut can be expensive. Extra guides, eight French systems. Okay, so that can be expensive. And number two, you will have complications, whether it's just a groin bleed or a perforation and you're calling in surgeons and things like that. So if you don't have your um, uh, team backing you up, it's going to be very hard. And the next third thing is RVU coverage. There are days I just do two CTOs or three CTOs, where, whereas the rest of my uh, colleagues who are covering the cat lab, I've done four or five left heart cats and seven or eight right heart cats. So we have a group RVU system. So we are not fighting for RVUs. So because it's a group RVU system, I can take my time, breathe in, do what I have to do and do it well without worrying about am I billing enough and things like that. So that's number one. Number two, if I'm, I work with a fellow, I don't have a two attending uh, system. So it's me, fellow, and a tech. And uh, it's a first-year uh, interventional fellow. It's not a complex chip fellow. It's a first-year interventional fellow. So when I have a complication, I immediately say, I need help. And the moment I say those three words, there'll be another attending who comes in. Sometimes if they're free, they will scrub in. Otherwise, they'll walk in and out and, you know, give me feedback. Or when I'm doing, uh, putting a covered stent, they will go help drain the pericardium or something like that. So if, if you don't have these key players and you are the only person doing everything and managing complications, you, uh, you know, talk about stress level, talk about burnout, you one case, you will get burnt out so i think it is the first step is to make sure you have the group buy-in and the uh, institution buy-in before you even go to the, uh, uh, the next step of learning and things like that yeah excellent point and i think there are sometimes uh, places where this is not welcome and complications become a big deal and um scrutinizing it's important to follow the complications and see what happens how you can improve it at the same time again if there is low tolerance for complications then complexity of PCI may not be the best uh, location for this um, for these cases um, and then in terms of um, uh, personal as you said it's a tough job and you've done a good job with stressing out but um, for people who want to do this 
What are avenues that you think can help them uh, go through their learning phase and then sustain their momentum, especially because the more successful you are, the more complex case you get, as you said. Mm -hmm. So how can you keep up with that kind of increasing demands on you? Uh, So I think the most important thing is be open to going, make sure you have time to go for all the conferences, okay? And then you have your own, build your own network of people uh, who you can, you know, take a picture of your case and send them to them and start planning your cases ahead and get different opinions from different friends to say, hey, I would, and you might pick one opinion from there. And if that fails, you have plan A, B, and C already discussed about. So, and then industry, like, you know, work with industry and uh, get your proctors in. So when you feel like you've made the shift uh, from going from, you know, CTO, JCTO one or two to three, four, five, that's when you actually need more of your village, your support system to talk to them and find out other options for your case. Or if you have failed a case, Take that case with you, go to somebody else's lab, have them do the case, scrub with them. That uh, I've done that too, uh, just so you, you learn from it. So every time you don't put a stent and you're just ballooning or you haven't done anything at all, that's the case you are going to discuss over and over again with five different people to know, understand why you failed, what could have been done differently. So you learn from your failures pretty much. Perfect. And then in terms of your um, um, day-to-day operations, do you do those cases specific days? Are they uh, done every day of the week? How have you ske- arranged your schedule to, to do those cases? So I'm in my, uh, uh, I do CTOs two days, okay? But if I have a CTO, uh, if I have two CTOs, I'm not the doc of the day. I'm not doing a right heart cat biopsy in between or something. I'm doing these two CTOs and I'm done. If the lab is overwhelmed, I might go help out, but my responsibility is just those two CTOs. So that's how I have done it. When I try to do CTO in the morning and added other cases in the afternoon, it gets a little cluttery and you know and you might just do a cto and the next case might be a lad diag bifurcation pci and you're like oh my god and then the third one might be something so i just do two ctos or three ctos and i'm done and it helps my lab also they are in the cto mode and um, they're also you know uh, like it that way and how long does it take you to prepare for a case uh, so prior to um I, I can't give you a time because I'm like, if this day is my CTO day, from Friday onwards, I'm checking the angiogram over and over again. Like, I see the pre procedure angiogram several times. Let me put it that way several times. <laughs> Uh, I can't tell in between my clinic patients I'll be looking at them and I'll be thinking about that and if it is a truly a complex case or something I'm thinking some I'm not looking at a, a, a horse that I'm thinking zebras I'm making phone calls I'm uh, you know I'm, I'm making phone calls to people and coming up with a plan talking it out to everyone uh, so I can't give you a particular time but the pre-procedure angiogram is being looked at several several times like despite the several times when my fellow is getting access i'm sitting in the control room i'm re-looking and re-looking have i missed something is there something else and if there's any attending even a non-cto operator i would be like come and tell me what are you thinking so you know one many brains as many brains i can involve in planning i i i use all of them <laughs> so i can't give you Perfect. a particular time <laughs> Perfect. And are there any cases that stick to your mind that have been very instructive in a good or bad way uh, so far? Oh, there are, you know, uh, you, uh, you, I, I don't know whether I told you this. In the Sky Wind Fellowship, they were asking us to compare, uh, give analogies to a procedure. So, and I said, CTOPCI is like a blind date. So sometimes you go for a <laughs> date and everything hits off and your pilot 200 flies in and it's great. And then the patient also feels fantastic. And, you know, that's the perfect uh, CTOPCI day. And then you do a retrograde case and it is, a uh, wire is stuck somewhere and the stent is stuck somewhere and you've left behind souvenirs inside the patient's body. Yes, I have great case. And then you do all of the hard work and the patient's like, 
I feel just the same. Nothing has changed at all. And that's like the biggest slap in your face, right? <laughs> You've spent four gray exp- radiation exposure and you haven't, a uh, patient doesn't feel any different. So yes, there are cases uh, both ways, which, uh, and then I have my, um, my tragedies, like uh, absolute, I tried my best, but despite my best efforts, I could not save the patient. And those um those cases heavily uh, stick in my head and literally uh, it's almost like sometimes I there are days when I'm meditating I actually call out the names in my head because I feel like that's my way of honoring them Um, you know uh, my surgical husband has told me that every great surgeon stands on the tombstones of the patient's they have lost. And I think uh, that kind of holds true to us interventional cardiologists too. And I think it is important to honor um, the patients we've lost by learning from the mistakes we've made from them so that we don't repeat the same again and again and again. Perfect. Now, do you have a favorite uh, book or a favorite movie? Favorite book, like a medical book, non-medical? Anything. Uh, Order medical, anything. Okay. My favorite medical book, I don't know whether people in the US will, uh, in India, we have to learn pathology from this massive Kumar Kotron and Robbins. Oh God, I love that book. And then you have the Papa Robbins, the daddy, big daddy and the baby Robbins. I was the big daddy Robbins girl. (laughs) I love the big daddy Robbins. And I truly like, you know, because our pathology was almost one and a half years. So we've, I have learned that entire book in medical school. So that's my favorite medical book. Non favorite uh, medical, uh, non favorite book. Um, I'm a big Harry Potter head. I have read and read and reread the entire Harry Potter series like a million times. Um, in fact, the audible version of it is what puts me to sleep every night. <laughs> <laughs> so I just put it on and it puts me off. I don't even get past one chapter. Or if I wake up in the middle of the night, that Jim Dale's um, baritone puts me back to sleep again. So that's my <laughs> favorite non medical Well, I guess Harry Potter in a way, right? That's uh, similar to the city operator. He starts, he goes to school, and then he becomes good and has to deal with all the surprises. So uh, very, very appropriate. But how about a movie? My favorite movie? Mm. I'm, you know, I truly loved the uh, the Avenger series. I was a big Avenger Marvel girl. Tony Stark is still my favorite. You know, this, you know, I want to do CT or PCI one day, like Tony Stark. <laughs> put my hand here, put my hand there, and find the robot and do it like that. So I truly, I think Iron Man One might be my favorite movie so far. I just love the uh, the computer graphics in that, and you know, and I'm like, why are we not doing like that? When is that going to happen to us in the uh, interventional world? Well, maybe sooner than we think. Yes, we'll find I'm hoping. <laughs> I'm very hopeful. <laughs> what excites you most right now? What? Oh, uh, like work-wise? Anywhere, work or personal. A hunk of calcium, man. I'm telling you, when I see a calcific <laughs> hunk, I'm like, yes, I'm going to get you. <laughs> that truly <laughs> gets to me and it breaks. It's almost like, oh, I'm not doing that case. This person is doing that case. I want that case so badly. <laughs> so how much of a, like calcium is the thing I love to hate. I love it so much and I want to hate it, but I love it a lot. So I want to, <laughs> I want to show it who's the boss kind of a situation. So yes, calcium excites me a lot uh outside of work i think hanging out my with my friends and my family my kids uh go visiting india i'm getting ready to go home so that you know uh, home home family and home is, is what would be the next outside of work well, it looks like uh, calcium is in trouble in your lab. doesn't have many chances there. So. Yeah, <laughs> is, sometimes I win. Great. Sometimes calcium does win over me. So I have learned to respect that damn calcium. <laughs> and what is next for you? What is uh, the next plan for you? Oh, oh it's a calm. I truly, truly, you know, um, want to... I feel like my creativity is limited because the time I spent in cat lab, I want to explore my 
creative slash entrepreneurial side of things, very baby steps. I mean, like in the found, some foundation scratching in the paper stage, um, I, 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 I want to explore more. I feel like there's, I, I want more out of life and this is great. I want more. I'm a greedy person. <laughs> That's the secret to success. Huh? <laughs> All right. Again, this was amazing. A, a lot of, uh, you know, intuition and a lot of great advice for the incoming uh, trainees. But if you had to summarize in a couple of three key points for them to take home. Um, find your passion. Okay. Don't give up. Keep trying. For, and just if this is what you want, just go for it. Don't let anything stop you. And it takes a village. Find your, develop your support system. It, it's not there for you to go, but it is, if you ask for help, it is there. But if you don't ask for help, no one's going to help you. So that would be my three or more takeaway points. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much. You have a great trip to India. I really appreciate you taking the time today and uh, we'll see you, I'm sure, soon in a couple of months in the next meeting. Thank you so much, Manas. It's, it was fantastic.